Uh, the most famous disciple of the Apostle John was a godly man named Polycarp. Uh, Polycarp became the, the Bishop of Smyrna, Smyrna uh, the town in which we are, this letter uh, is addressed to the church. Uh, Smyrna was a densely populated Jewish city that had strong ties to, uh, of loyalty towards Rome. Uh, Polycarp probably would have been in his mid-twenties when he heard this letter to Smyrna. As a young man, he had to make a choice to follow Jesus Christ. And in choosing to follow Jesus, he, had to, he was choosing a life of persecution, of earthly poverty and constant opposition. Well, we know throughout church history that because of church history, Polycarp made the choice to follow Jesus. Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. So John probably wrote this when he was in his 90s. Uh, Polycarp was probably in his 20s. Uh, 60 years younger than, um, than John. And John's influence with this, over this young man strengthened the church at Smyrna during his day and long after the Lord called him home. John served as a missionary to the future by giving his life for the next generation. Uh, tonight, I pray you come back, we'll hear that exhortation again, that we would live our lives for the next generation. The message, of John, the message John gave in life was the message he embraced by the, in the face of death, to be faithful to Jesus Christ. I pray that whatever stage of life we find ourselves in this morning, a young man or woman at the beginning of your life with Christ or a senior saint nearing the end, I pray that you would be faithful to Jesus Christ because he is worth it. First point this morning is be faithful to the living one. Be faithful to the living one. John begins each one of his, his letters in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation with a different description of the, the vision that John had in Revelation 1, 9 through 20. Here it says in Revelation 1, 8, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Right here off the bat, Jesus is try, try, trying to say, I am alone, the only sovereign one in history. I am in control of all things. Jesus is eternal. He is the beginning and the end. The prophet Isaiah, in, in, in his marvelous section, verse chapters 40 to chapter 48, three times it's pictured this idea of the first and the last. And every time it's related to, 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 the, to the divine one, God himself. Jesus here is, is calling himself the divine one, our, our, our triune God. We have God the Son, God the Spirit, and God the Father. Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity. Now, they're all equal, and yet they have different roles in our salvation. The Father has sent the Son to be our mediator, to purchase our salvation by offering himself to be our peace. Beloved, we know it is hard to be faithful to God in a fallen world. Faithfulness is the unswerving allegiance and steadfast trust in God. Whatever comes, there's a multiplicity of temptations for believers. Wealth, comfort, pleasure that appears more attractive than the life of poverty, trials, and denial. How can we remain faithful? With all these temptations that are flying our way to the church, how can we remain faithful? We know that there are many in the church who have not remained faithful. There are many throughout church history who have started with Jesus and have drifted away from him. Even in the Bible, Demas, Judas, who once spent time with the Lord and then drifted from him. So how can we remain faithful? Well, we remain faithful by looking to him who calls us to be faithful. Jesus Christ. He's the one who died for our sins. He committed no wrong and he knew no sin. He was innocent of all transgression. He was faithful to every word that the Father gave him. And every way that the scripture describes. And although he was perfect... He remained faithful unto death. He was obedient to death, even death on a cross. The one that not only de does not only demand your faithfulness, but he provides you an example of that faithfulness. 
So Jesus is not only our Lord and Savior and our, and our God who, who came and died for us, He's also our example that shows you how can you remain faithful. He was faithful unto death. But, as the Scripture says here, He came to life. There's a great promise in faithfulness. The resurrection is our reward. Romans 6.5 For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. And one of my favorite scriptures, 1 Peter uh, 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is undefiled, unfading, and unblemished, that is kept in heaven for us by faith. Even in the scripture that, that Robert read to you earlier, this great Psalm 16 that says that the lines have fallen on me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. The one way that we can endure during uh, times of difficulty and trials now is the promise that God give, has given us in the resurrection. The beautiful resurrection. And sometimes I think that we are struggling in the midst of our trials because we don't see how beautiful the inheritance is that God has prepared for us. The resurrection has to sustain saint after saint after saint to persevere in the midst of trial. What the resurrection tells us is that Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it. He's a glorious Savior and promises a glorious inheritance. When we are tempted to drift from Jesus, we will remember what He has done for us and what He has promised to us. Polycarp was arrested for his faith. There was a warrant out for his arrest, and he was traveling from house to house to avoid capture, and finally he realized that if I don't give myself up, others will be tortured because of me. So he offered himself to be arrested. He was brought into a stadium surrounded by a crowd that wanted him dead. The Roman proconsul asked him, Are you Polycarp? Yes. He said, swear to Rome and I will set you free. Curse Christ. Polycarp responded, for 86 years I have been his servant and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? In the hour of Polycarp's greatest test, he remembered the kindness and mercy of the Savior. Jesus had done him wrong. No wrong. He saved him. In the hour of your temptation, whether it be the, the computer screen, in your office, at the dinner table with family over the holidays, you must remember that Jesus is the first and the last who died for you and came to life again. He will do you no harm. Be faithful to the living one. The second way we are commanded to be faithful here is be faithful in the loss of wealth. Be faithful in the loss of wealth. Uh, this letter to Smyrna is the, is the only uh, uh, one of two letters that, that Jesus wrote to the church in uh, the churches of Asia that had no negative um, exhortation. It was all positive commendations. And one of the greatest threats to our faithfulness, and not only in this day but all days, is wealth. The potential loss of wealth or resources or salary. Jesus begins his letter to the church. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. Jesus knows the cost paid to be his disciples. Smyrna, like I said before, was a largely Jewish, Jewish city that had strong ties to loyalty to Rome. And if you wanted to uh, be... Um, because the, uh, the Jews had, had strong loyalty to Rome, that they only employed those who had the same mindset. Uh, the, the, the Jews were allowed to, to worship God because they were, uh, when Rome kind of took over, they were the largest religion for the sake of peace of the empire. They let the Jews worship God and not bow to Caesar. But in Smyrna, the imperial cult of the Romans kind of permeated every aspect of the city's life. Economic prosperity and greater social standing was only allowed if you participated in that Roman cult. 
So as Christians, if you refuse to go along with society, you refuse to, to bow and, and embrace this imperial cult, you were ostracized. You were ostracized from society. You were denied the jobs, and you became poor. They would not have moved up the social ladder, but were most likely not hired in the first place. And the community would have avoided their businesses. So even if you didn't, weren't hired to, to work somewhere else, they would not come and shop at your store because you were a Christian. To follow Christ in the first century often meant choosing a life of poverty. And yet Christians chose to be poor rather than denying the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that that's a question that we need to ask ourselves today. Will we be faithful to the Lord in the threat of the loss of wealth? Will you choose to be poor rather than denying Jesus Christ? Beloved, there are members of our church here who have chosen that very thing who saw corrupt business practices happening at their job and said, I will not be a part of your company because I will not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. There's others who are facing that right now, who are under constant pressure from their employer to deny Jesus or the principles that Jesus has laid out in his word. Do you know who they are and are you praying for them? I pray that we would always be faithful unto Christ. As the moral revolution continues to unfold, more and more Christians will lose their jobs simply by holding to Christian values. Specifically, a Christian sexual ethic. If you believe that, that God created man and woman to be, to be married only to uh, each other, a, a um, naturally born man and a naturally born woman, you are going to continue to be ostracized from our society. Holding to a biblical view of marriage will cost you your job. Will you be faithful in the temptation of the loss of wealth? One of the marks of the early church is that they kind of lived with this familial sharing. The Bible says that each gave to each other as any had need. I think this is one of the reasons why the early church was able not to deny Christ in the threat of loss of wealth. Because the church realized it is our responsibility to care for one another. So if you lose your job and you can't provide for yourself, we as a body will take care of you. Because we do not want to, you to deny Christ in your workplace. They truly bared each, other bur each other's burdens. How, 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 are we willing to do that? Are we willing to sacrifice our abundance to give to those who are in need because they sacrificed their jobs for the sake of Christ. I pray we would. Let us choose to be poor with Christ than rich without him. Jesus reminded the church that even though we are poor in earthly means, we are rich in the spiritual realm. You see that kind of parentheses in the text? It says, you are poor, but you are rich. You are rich. Even here, Jesus is reminding us to follow him. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Jesus became poor so we could become rich. Do you view your wealth as a tool to make others spiritually rich? As we move into a season of increased persecution here in the States, it will take the resources of the entire body to encourage faithfulness. So I pray we would commit to living as a spiritual family and give freely to all who have need. We don't know when that's coming, but beloved, trust me, it is. We see it happening in the West, whether you're a, a Christian baker or a Christian photographer, that, that you get sued and lose your job or your business. Are we going to rise up as a congregation here and care for those if one loses their job because they refuse to deny Christ? I pray we would. But not only do we want to be faithful in the loss of wealth, third point, we want to be faithful in the loss of reputation. Faithful in the loss of reputation. Proverbs 22.1, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver and gold. The reputations of Christians in Smyrna was under attack. Uh, the, the, the Jews were, like I said before, were allowed to kind of function in their own uh, religious worship. Uh, and, and because of that, um, the, the Christians was an early Jewish sect. So they were allowed to, to kind of worship under, that, under the freedom of the Jews. Well, as time went on, the, 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 the Jews looked at the Christians and they, they kind of separated themselves from the Christians. And so they, they are not a Jewish sect. 
So because they're not a Jewish sect, they have to offer worship on to Caesar. And we see here in, in the text that these uh, Jews in, quote, in, these Jews in Smyrna were causing trouble for the Christians. So look at verse 9 again. It says, I know your tribulation and your poverty, and, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Paul writes in Romans that a true Jew, one who is truly a Jew, is not one outwardly, but one inwardly. Uh, and circumcision is not, not a matter of, uh, it's not a physical circumcision, but it's of the, of the heart. Here, there, there are those who claim to be Jews, but they weren't true Jews. They were following Satan. They were under the influence or the, uh, the, the, the control of the evil one. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. The word slanderer is really from the, the, the Greek word where we get uh, accuser for Satan himself. He is the one who spits false accusation against God's people. And these Jews were followers of the slanderer. We should just, we should just pause for that for a second. Do you realize that every time you slander someone, Every time you slander someone, you are following Satan. Every time. Now we know from James chapter 3 that the, the tongue is hard to control. It is a restless evil. But beloved, we best guard our tongues. I recently talked to a, a brother who was... Uh, had to resign from his church because of the slander of the people of God. Making accusations against him, accusations against his wife, and no one had any facts. Beloved, let us not be slanderers, but let us be those who bring peace. We must be resolute in trusting Jesus with our reputation. Because what is the natural thing when you feel someone is speaking against you or slandering you? You want to make it right. You want to speak up and say, this is what the, the truth is. You know, when, when my reputation is slandered, there's a part of me that just kind of wants to well up and defend myself and let, let you know that that's not true. Uh, but I think, although there may be times for that, I think that what we would do is, is follow Christ here is that we would trust that God is the first and the last. That we trust our reputation and our name with God himself. Because that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did. 1 Peter 2.23, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but in continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Read through 1 Peter. You just see this time and time again. When you're reviled, you don't revile back. When, when, when we're slandered, we, we, we respond with gentleness and respect. For those who slander us will be put to shame. We must continue to trust ourselves to a faithful creator while doing good. Beloved, give your reputation to the Lord. But the main thrust of this text, I think, is, is this fourth point. Be faithful in the loss of breath. Be faithful in the loss of breath. The church of Smyrna was facing a very real possibility of death. And Jesus exhorts them not to fear because he is the living one. We will always face death as Christians, remembering that God has promised us a resurrection. Look at what chapter 2 verse 10 says. Do not Fear. Now, just uh, we, we looked at this a couple weeks ago when we looked at the, the saying of Jesus in chapter 1. Just to kind of refresh your, your, your memory, go read Isaiah 41 and see all the times it says, do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. What, the reason why we do not have to fear is because Jesus Christ is the first and the last. This is a theme that's kind of woven throughout Scripture. It says, do not fear what you are about to suffer. That is, that is not a hypothetical. You are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested. And for ten days you will have tribulation. 
Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The devil is going to work through human agents to persecute the church. He always has and he always will use earthly agents to tear down the church. And God is going to use the wickedness of the persecution to purify his church. The church will be tested. Everything that happens to you cannot happen to you outside the loving care of God himself. Everything that's going to come in your life has to pass through God's hands first. And because they pass through God's hands, we know ultimately they will work for our good. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. It says, In this you rejoice, this great inheritance that God has promised us, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the detested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is one of the hardest things sometimes to understand. There are things happening in the life of our church, trials that people are facing that are severe. And, and, and regardless how severe the trial is, this, this, this word proves true, that God allows things to happen in our life to purify us, to, to, sit, to, to help us become more like Christ, so they would result to His praise, His glory, and His honor. And then I look at my own life, the trials that I face, and they seem so small compared to the trials of many of you here. I may not fully be able to relate to the trials you're facing, but this word is no less true. The Lord is with you. The Bible says here that the ten days of tribulation will come, probably not referring to a literal ten days, uh, more likely symbolic. Uh, ten days most likely alluding to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the ten-day fast in Babylon when they were challenged to eat the king's food. And they said, we will not give us ten days uh, and see if we are stronger than the other men. Really, throughout the, the history of, of the church, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel were always looked at those who were faithful unto death. God spared Daniel in the lion's den. God spared Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. God will spare the church at Smyrna and give them the crown of life. Beloved, as God will spare even us if we were faithful to the end. You know, Polycarp heard this probably when he was in his 20s. He probably shared these words uh, to the church as he was bishop. Be faithful unto death, and Jesus will give you the crown of life. But as so often in the early church, he didn't just speak it with his words. He, he believed it with his, with his life. As I told you, Polycarp was brought into the Roman stadium, and he was put on trial. And uh, the Christians were behind him, and the stadium was in front of him. And, and what, what the Roman proconsul asked him to do was to turn to the Christians and say, away with the atheist. Christians were looked at as atheists because they would not bow to Caesar as Lord. And instead of Polycarp turning to the Christians, he turned to the crowd and says, away with the atheist calling everyone there believers, non-believers in the Lord God. The proconsul continued to threaten Polycarp. He said, I have wild beasts. I shall throw you to them if you don't change your attitude. He said, call them. You cannot change our attitude if it means a change from better to worse. If you make light of beasts, I'll have you destroyed by fire unless you change your attitude. The governor said, and Polycarp responded, The fire you threaten burns for a time and is soon extinguished. There's a fire you know nothing about. The fire of judgment to come and eternal punishment. There is the fire reserved for the ungodly. But why do you hesitate? Do what you want. The proconsul was amazed, so he sent a, a, a crier, a proclaimer, to go into the middle of the stadium and says, Polycarp has professed Christ. Polycarp has professed Christ. 
Polycarp has confessed Christ. And almost in unison, the crowd, the crowd yelled to burn him. Burn him. He was trusting in the words of his Savior and King. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Polycarp has stood in a long line of Christians who have been faithful unto death. They did not trust in this world, but they trusted in the crown of life that Jesus has promised he will give us. So lastly, we be faithful for the life to come. Be faithful for the life to come. There are two deaths for us. There's the first death when our bodies perish from this life. Then there's the second death where our bodies and souls perish forever in hell. Revelation 20, verse 14, the final judgment, it says, The death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This is what Polycarp meant when he said, there's a fire that you know nothing about. The fire of the judgment to come and, and the, of eternal punishment. The, the fire reserved for the ungodly. The ungodly were those whose names are written in the book of life. Or not written in the book of life. And here it is. That should be where our names should not appear. Because we are the ungodly. We're the ones who, who lived our own way. We're the ones who, who reveled in sin. We're the ones who did not trust in Christ. And yet Jesus came to give life and life more abundantly. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, you will not be hurt by the second death. Jesus calls out to all who hear his voice. The one who conquers in faith will not be hurt in the second death. They will perish in this life, and then they will experience the blessed inheritance that he has prepared for us. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. How do we conquer? The way we conquer is to be conquered. The way we conquer is to be conquered. We are ungodly and unrighteous. We deserve the second death, but God sent Jesus Christ, the living one. He came to die and rise again. Jesus conquered the second death through his resurrection. We conquer by allowing Jesus to conquer us. To say that he is our king, he is our commander, he is our Lord. We surrender to his lordship. We bow to him as king. It is only by being conquered by Christ that we will, be, we will conquer with Christ in the life to come. We all must make a choice. Will we bow our knee to Christ and let him conquer us? Or will we bow our knee to the flesh and live for our own will? You know, as I said, Polycarp was a young man when he first heard these words. He made the choice to follow Christ. He says, for 86 years I've been his servant and he done me no, has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? When the time came and the wood was placed at his feet, after living these verses for 60 years, Polycarp bowed his head and prayed. He, he prayed, O oh, Father, of thy beloved and blessed Son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have come to know thee, the God of angels and powers and all creation, of the whole family of the righteous who live in thy presence. I bless thee for counting me worthy of this day and hour that the number of the martyrs I may partake of Christ's cup to the resurrection of eternal life of both soul and body and the imperishability that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. Polycarp took the cup of Christ's death and the hope of his resurrection. He believed in the promise 
Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Friends, I pray that you would heed Christ's words as Polycarp did. That you'd be faithful, be steadfast, be immovable in the hope of the gospel. Be loyal unto Christ. Be faithful unto death. Be conquered by Christ so that you will conquer the second death with Christ. He has promised the conqueror's crown. Will you receive it? Heavenly Father, I pray that we would conquer by surrendering ourselves unto Thee. God, I pray that we would be faithful unto death. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.